My early life. I was born on the 16th of February 1949 at 9.50am at Boundary Park General Hospital, Oldham, Lancashire. My mother's name was Elsie Dyson Clark, who was married to my father, Thomas George Clark, some time after the war. She informed me that this is the hospital that is next to Oldham Athletic Football Ground. We lived with my mother's father in his house at 26 Fleet Street, Clarksfield, Oldham. My granddad's name was Watts Ormrod, and he was a retired craftsman and a senior member of a trade union. His hair was white, which I am told was due to an accident at work when a large rivet was pushed through his hand. I had a brother who was two and a half years older than me, Michael John spelt Michael instead of Michael, due to my mother's stubbornness when he was named at the registrar's office. The official informed her that the way she had spelt Michael was in fact wrong, and my mum reacted at being corrected and insisted it would be spelt just as she had written it. My mum and dad were both in the armed forces and were very proud to be British. Dad was in the army and mum was in the Royal Air Force. I was christened at Christ Church, Glodwick, and my godfather was David Maltby of 282 Barton Road, Stratford, and he was a sidesman at the church on Barton Road. He gave me, at the time, a Bible with a text of scripture written on the inside cover, Proverbs 3, verse 6, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I have found also a baptism certificate dated 3rd of April, 1949, where it states, I became a member of Christ, the child of God, and an inheritor of the kingdom of God. This, however, was wrong, as I did not become a member of Christ until I was born again on the 6th of January, 1970, which I speak about later. I remember attending the church, the Sunday school at Christ Church, called St Barnabas Sunday School, which was just along the road from our house in Fleet Street. On one occasion, it was so cosy, I sat in the pew. I fell asleep and woke up with a jolt, wondering where I was, just as the vicar had finished his sermon. I'd been lulled into sleep by the stimulating sermon. I hadn't changed even today. I must have been about three or four years old. It was my mother's idea to take my brother and I to the Sunday school. At Sunday school, I remember we painted pictures of houses and still remember wondering why did the teachers draw houses with doors in the middle of the building and windows either side of the door. This was because I knew we lived in a terraced house and our door was one side and the window to the other, just as other houses in the street. I had no spiritual impressions of the Lord Jesus Christ from those times. Just across the street from our house, there was a large, great Roman Catholic church building and living accommodation surrounded by a high wall. It was built of red engineering bricks and several stories high with stained glass windows along the long church building. I remember looking up at the crooked lightning conductor and still get the feeling of austerity and awkwardness when wondering what was behind the wall, it produced the same feeling in me when I was told that story of Toby Twirl, when it was read to me. In that story, he meets a giant who lived behind a great high-walled castle. I was afraid to go near or even think of climbing the wall or trespassing the grounds. I did not know it was a Roman Catholic church building until about 25 years later when my mother informed me. At that time, I knew no other religion than that of the Church of England. I assumed my mother was right in all such things, and so the Catholics were wrong. I remember the street lamps because a man used to come along each night and light them. They were gas lamps and he had a small ladder which he carried with him with a pointed end on it. He climbed up the ladder and lit the lamp each night. I assumed they were gas lamps. I remember my favourite sweets were what we called Kali. It was called sherbet now. We could also buy a very small loaf of bread, which we called a penny loaf. At that time, when I was about four years old, I wanted to go to another Sunday school, which was on Lee's Road. My mother must have taken me there before. On this occasion, it was Saturday morning, and I believed it was Sunday and I didn't believe there was no Sunday school on that day. After being dressed, I think my mum must have humoured me and 
did not take me seriously. I said I was going to Sunday school. I left home. I didn't think my mum realised, and I walked at least two miles along Balfour Street and along the busy Lees Road and found the building. To my disappointment, it was all locked up. On my return, seeking to go home, I wandered off and got lost and ended up asking for help from someone in a laundry shop. They put me in the window with a lost boy ticket and they called the police. I was soon returned home. I think my mother was horrified how far, how far I'd been. I commenced my school days at Clarksfield Infant School. My brother Michael was John, already attending there, and, and he was in the third year when I started. I remember my first day at school in the classroom with other children. The ceilings were high, and there were things like sand pits, blackboard easels, old-fashioned classroom desks and tables. The girl next door, being Vivian Butler, began school with me, and I can remember her crying for her mum. I remember not feeling the need to cry, and I tried to comfort her and assure her that all would be well. My Aunt Edith was very good to us boys, and we would visit her every Saturday. She lived with my granddad's sister. She was called Aunt Alice. Aunt Edith would take us to the great park in Oldham, Alexander Park, and on the way we would call it the chip shop. And in those days the chips were real chips, cooked in real fat. One of our favourite meals she cooked was potato pie with red cabbage. In her house there was a cellar, which I always liked to visit. I think at one time washing was done in the cellar. At that time my brother was probably the only close friend I had, although we were not too close, he was just there. We used to go swimming on a Saturday morning to Waterhead's bath. This type of swimming bath was typical of the old-fashioned bars of the time. They were small, the water green, the walls cream tiled, and at the side of the pool there were what we call slipper baths, where you could sit up to your chin in hot water and carbolic soap was supplied to wash with. It was very cosy. In fact, the whole atmosphere was cosy and not like the cold clinical bars of modern times. Next door was the wash house where mum used to go at the same time to do her washing. One Saturday morning I nearly drowned and was saved by an attendant called Norman. I had tiptoes backwards and as the pool got slowly deeper and deeper I found I could not touch the bottom. It was through the providence of God that the attendant turned to see me reaching upwards out of the water. I couldn't speak. He dived in to rescue me and I can still feel the fear today of nearly drowning. Across the road from the swimming bath was a slaughterhouse, next door to the inhabited houses. We were very curious and wanted to look through the slatted windows to see the men kill the animals and the pigs and the sheep. This was awesome and ghoulish and a fearful thing. But we were very curious and wanted to see how the men slew the animals. There was blood, animals' intestines, animals' heads, bones and blood. The smell was awful and not pleasant at all and it seemed as though the pigs knew they were going to be slaughtered and that their end had come. I have wondered about my brother since then, as he was two and a half years older than me, how this may have affected him later on in his life, as he demonstrated a callous way which was characteristic of killing without mercy, just like these slaughtermen. About this time, I remember coming home from school in the dusk of the day. The house seemed unusually quiet. I noticed some blood on my brother's book, and my mum told me there'd been an accident. My brother had fallen down a basement stairway shaft at school and landed on his back. He was concussed, and I remember then feeling how precious life was. My brother could have died through that fall. It was awesome. I still had no recollections of God during this time. On one occasion, my parents were invited to a friend's for the day. They owned a pub and had two boys, both younger than me. On that occasion, I was on my own and noticed that the till in the pub was open and money was available. I quickly took some money and walked out of the room. In order to cover up my tracks, I went and told the parents of the boys that they had pressed the till button and the till had opened. That was a lie made up to cover my sin and I tried to pass the blame onto their children. I felt bad after that and I still do, as not only had I taken their money, but I would also put my parents into disrespect, having a thief as a son. Oldham is a town in the north of England, not far from the city of Manchester, 
and during the 19th century was a very industrial town and community famous for its cotton mills. In fact, my grandfather was a great supporter of the trade union. As a child, I remember the old cotton mills, red brick built with huge chimneys towering high above the windows. Also the water reservoirs we were always warned to stay away from. My mother had spoken about children being drowned in them and this was sufficient for me to obey her. The full story is told in Davy's book, Borstal Boys, available from Amazon.co.uk and Amazon.com.